The um, theme this year is transportation. So we're picking up where we left off last year. Last year was the 100th anniversary of the railroad. So this year we're looking at the challenges uh, in transportation in terms of getting to Pemberton or getting things out of Pemberton. And it really all starts with this period in the early 1800s. So we're going to talk about the gold rush from 1858 through to the time John Curry finally arrived in the 1880s. We are going to focus on the Pemberton aspect of the Douglas Trail. The whole Gold Rush Trail ran from Harrison Lake through to Pemberton, Port Anderson, and Seton, but we'll largely just be focusing on the Pemberton section of the trail in this talk. The Francis Ermitanger, and he was a Hudson's Bay man. He uh, came through the area in 1827, and that was around the time Fort Langley was founded. He uh, was the first explorer on record to penetrate the valleys of the Birkenhead and Lillooet rivers. He came down from Kamloops through Seton and Anderson Lakes. And he was looking for a route to bypass the Fraser Canyon so fur brigades could safely make their way between Kamloops and Fort Langley. He was born in Portugal in 1798, educated in England, but him and his brother became Hudson's Bay apprentice, apprentices in 1818. So he was in Canada a long time, by the time he came through this area. He served in the West. He uh, was part of the Severn District, and he also served from 1825 to 1846. He was in the Columbia District. He was made the chief factor in 1842, and he died in 1858. So he died the year the gold rush began. We have Alexander Colfield Anderson. He died in 1884. He was an interesting character. I've read A.C. Anderson's journals. They're quite uh, well written, and uh, you can read about his first through this area. Uh, he, in 1846, that was the year the Oregon Treaty was signed, which meant that the Columbia River was no longer a viable route for Hudson's Bay to use to get first port. So they were quite desperate to find other routes. So A.C. Anderson had, was given the task of finding a route through to Kamloops, and he took this lowland route through uh, Harrison, Lillooet, and Anderson and Seton Lakes. He started in Lillooet and traveled by foot and canoe, and his report when passing along Seton was not very positive. Uh, in short, there does not exist the slightest probability of a horse road in this direction suitable for Hudson's Bay purposes. Rocks rise 1,000 to 1,500 feet in height on both sides and preclude all possibility of all progress by land, save perhaps by scaling the craggy cliffs along the side. He also remarked that the background scenery is the most rugged and dreary looking track I've ever met with, and I had no previous conception that so mountainous a region could exist so near the banks of a large stream like the Fraser. And a little bit about A.C. Anderson after uh, he came through here. Um, he served for the Hudson's Bay and uh, served until 1851, but he retired in 1854 at the young age of 40. And in 1858, he was curious about his gold rush, so he called up his good friend James Douglas, who was the governor of the colonies, because James Douglas had been the chief factor of the Hudson's Bay. And uh, Anderson, or Douglas, said, you have to come to Victoria and hold office for me. I need a man like you. So Anderson uh, headed off to Victoria, and he was appointed. Uh, he had several uh, government positions. But in the 1870s, he was the inspector of fisheries with uh, jurisdiction over BC's coastal and inland waters. And in 1882, when traveling on fisheries business, he was forced to spend the night on a sandbar and he almost died, and his health never recovered, and he died shortly after that experience. Treaty. Um, it was established in 1846. It set out the boundary between the U.S. and British North America, because remember, there was no Canada yet in 1846. So they established the border at the 49th parallel, with the exception of Vancouver Island, which was retained in its entirety by the British. Um, the U.S. portion of the region was organized as Oregon Territory in 1848, and Washington Territory was 
organized in 1853. The British portion remained unorganized until 1858 when gold was found. Up until then, you guys, nobody wanted this area. Nobody wanted the mountains. The British wanted the island. There wasn't very good farmland. It was very hard to get through the mountains. So there wasn't a lot of interest. But what was going on in the States is, starting in 1844, there was a real push and pull between American expansionists, people that just wanted to keep uh, settling all lands and moving west, uh, versus those that just wanted to organize the U.S. within some boundaries. Um, so this is where, in 1844, there were some political slogans like 54, 40, or fight. There was a, an idea that they would claim the lands all the way up to Alaska. The Oregon Treaty was signed on June 15, 1846. This is the same year uh, A.C. Anderson was sent off to find a route. So this is why, because the ink was drying and the Hudson's Bay people were worried about, well, how are we going to get our furs to market? The treaty was negotiated by the U.S. Secretary of State James Buchanan, who later became a U.S. President, and the treaty defined the border, and it forever changed the way shipping companies navigated the Columbia River. In the summer of 1858, 30,000 gold rushers began making their way from San Francisco after rumors spread about a ship arriving from B.C., and it was carrying 800 ounces of gold. So I love the internet. I had to know, well, how much is that worth today? So that's worth well over a million dollars. Um, in 1858, an ounce of gold was worth $20, and $20 in 1858 would be worth 570 U.S. dollars today. So those who made their way to the gold fields at Lillooet were facing a winter with short supplies. The governor of Vancouver Island, James Douglas, took quick action to ensure food and freight could get up to these men who were now camped out in Lillooet. So A.C. Anderson was called in to survey the lakes route, and he reported back that the length of the trails to connect the lakes would be 69 miles, and the length of the lakes would be 56 miles. So the route would be 125 miles from Fort Langley up to Lillooet. James Douglas was the chief factor for the Hudson's Bay Company when he governed Vancouver Island. He acted on his own initiative to keep the gold rush from spinning out of control. Because remember, the British were given the island. They really didn't have the mainland. But Governor Douglas, in his own initiative, decided to claim the mainland for the Queen. So that's what he did in 1858. He remained governor of both Vancouver Island and British Columbia until his retirement in 1864. And he's often credited as the father of British Columbia. James Douglas's authority was finally um, written down in 1860 with uh, his proclamation. It's also known as the Road Tolls Act. And this is what enabled him to charge the miners a uh, bond or a tax there, that they had to pay in order to travel the Gold Rush Trail. And then they could stake a claim when they got to the gold fields at Little Wood. So this, uh, we have. Uh, Bernard Thor to thank, who pulled this out in his fight with the BC Supreme Court around the High Line Road issue that was recently resolved in court. So we got a copy of this from BC Archives, this original proclamation. The original road builders were assembled that summer, and a crew of 500 men came together under the command of AC Anderson. So see, Douglas had all kinds of jobs for A.C. Anderson in 1858. Go survey the lakes, run the road crew, and they established Port Douglas at the head of Harrison Lake. And they constructed a trail then from Douglas called the Douglas Portage to the south end of Lillooet Lake, and there another building was raised. That was called uh, the Lillooet Lake House, or Little Lillooet. And then in early September, Port Pemberton was established at the head of Lillooet Lake. Later, that little, little Lillooet Lake house, um, that area today is known as Tenas Lake, and it was also known as 29 Mile. Port Pemberton, though, was named in honor of Joseph Despard Pemberton, who was the Surveyor General of Vancouver Island, and he uh, was, I guess, in need of honoring, but he never actually came to Pemberton. So for a man uh, that the town was named after, he uh, never made the trip. The name, uh, or by mid-October, 
then of 1858, a rough trail was passable, so no wagons, just uh, pack horses. And then in 1859, Lieutenant H. Spencer Palmer of the Royal Engineers began surveying the wagon roads that would replace the trails between the lakes. This is an easier map to understand. This comes out of the Irene Edwards book. So it shows the Douglas Trail coming up through the lakes, but it's also showing you the Canyon Trail and all the settlements along the Canyon Trail. In that first summer, there were men trying to go up the Fraser Canyon as well as coming through this lakes route. It was free, a free-for-all, and they basically went wherever they could go. There were no uh, census counters in those days, but it's estimated that anywhere from 200 to 1,000 men died trying to get up the Fraser Canyon, because they were literally, some of them, paddling rafts and leaky canoes. So this is Port Douglas. This is a very, the earliest photograph we have of Port Pemberton. It's a Charles Gentile photo, and he came through the region taking photographs of these stopping places. You can see there are no trees left because they were running steamships and everything was powered by wood so they cut down pretty much every tree and you can't really make out the buildings. And this is a, a drawing of 29 mile. So that first year mule trains and flat bottom boats were used along the trail in the first year. In the early years camels were also tried out as pack animals. But they frightened the mules, and they were soon abandoned to wander their lives around Little Island. I think the last one died in the 1880s. At the first whiff of a camel, somebody is quoted, mules and oxen did everything but climb trees. <laughs> so prior to large stern wheelers plying the waters of the lake, the first year of the gold rush saw many First Nation packers, canoes, and entrepreneurs with flat bottom long boats who made their living moving the hordes of gold rushers through the area. From Mount Curry, Felix Leo, Paul Dick's father, and Charlie Mack's father were involved as packers in these early years. And Chief Francis Wallace also remembered traveling the route as a child with his father, who was also a packer. And in 1858, A.C. Anderson and his road building crew tried to stop a Chinese company who were making quite a lot of money ferrying provisions across Little Wet Lake. But I can't tell you about the gold rush without mentioning Judge Begbie and Arthur Bushby. These are some of the funniest travel journals you can read of this era. This Arthur Bushby had a great sense of humor. Governor Douglas wanted to keep law and order at all costs because of all the murders and strife that had happened associated with the California gold rush. He didn't want all of this happening here. So he asked for England's help. So they sent him Judge Matthew Begbie. And um, he had a traveling companion, Arthur Bushby. And they traveled the new route in 1859 to report to Douglas. Also, in, uh, at Fort Langley, in the video you see how there was a swearing-in ceremony for James Douglas. Uh, James swore Judge Begbie in at that ceremony, and the judge swore James in at that ceremony. They were the two men with the uh, power to do so. At, uh, Begbie was known as the hanging judge, though it, it's unclear exactly how many men he hung, but it sounds like it was just a few. But he did put the fear of death into all wrongdoers. Here, I've got an excerpt for you from Bushby's journal uh, from their travels through the Pemberton area. He says, started early, after a good breakfast of beans and coffee. Met a lot of Chinamen and the old white horse gave out today. We had an excellent meal at Mr. O'Brien's store. How did we just peg into it after living for a month on bacon and flour? Pemberton is at the foot of Little Wet Lake and will be a rising place. I have just been to the lake and had a good wash. My boots have given way, and my flannel shirt, which I've had in constant wear since March 8th, is getting rather dirty. Beard is getting long and shaggy. Hands and face well browned and scratched. Hands and feet, ditto, in capital condition. I am now scribbling on a pile of blankets in a tent in the very lap of luxury, and I'm now off to try and get a shot at some ducks. <laughs> <laughs> there were several uh, of these stern wheelers that operated on the lakes. Anderson and Seton Lakes, they all had their own boats. Uh, Lillooet Lake, the first boat to operate was in uh, 1860, and it was the 65-foot Marzell. It replaced the Chinese ferrymen, who were making lots of money. So Captain Goulding uh, built the 65-foot Marzell. 
and they were carrying cargo for mines and mining. And um, by this time, Port Douglas merchants had imported a number of wagons because the road was continually getting improved. It was no longer a trail, and they were going to start running wagons from Port Douglas up. This image in the slide shows the Prince of Wales. It replaced the Marzell in 1863. So, as, you know, as late as 1863, they were expecting a lot of people were going to keep coming this way. This boat was 115 feet long, and it was only possible to build a boat that large because the Royal Engineers built a dam at the south end of Lillooet Lake, uh, in between Lillooet Lake and what today is Tanas, so that the lakes could be brought to the same level, like a walk, and these ships could be dragged or winched through that passage. Joe Peters of Mount Curry spoke of community stories in the old days uh, of Little Watt men who helped with that winching operation. It would have taken a lot of men, and it would have been fairly scary, I think, with gigantic cables hauling a 115-foot steamship through those two lakes. The bottom image is of Slim Foberg and some remnants of cribbing at Port Pemberton that was still visible in the 1970s. Thanks to the Fulbergs, we actually have some images of the old sites because they frequented those sites looking for artifacts and at the same time they took some photographs. Today there is nothing left of these sites. This is the survey map of Port Pemberton that the Royal Engineers did. This was a sketch and it was meant to illustrate the proposed road extension to a new place to tie up. It shows a large building belonging to P. Smith & Company, Nelson's Barn, a Spaniard's cabin, and Pemberton House. There was also a Little Watt village at this site. Several squats also existed, and these squatters were evicted in 1863 because a new road was coming through. And the extension led from the port to an all-seasons landing with room to turn a team farther down the lake shore. Officials at the time believed heavy traffic would continue through this area for a long time. That same map, now it's flipped upside down, and this is Port Pemberton, over top of an aerial photograph from the 1970s. Where you see A, that's where the head of Lillooet Lake is in the 70s, compared to where the head of the lake would have been in the 1850s. That's due to the amount of silt that comes down the Birkin and Lillooet Rivers, so the head of that lake is constantly moving south. Port Pemberton shelters and eats. None of us could have afforded to eat there. It was worse than Whistler. So <laughs> by... 1859, Port Pemberton had five to six log cabins, shelters, and eating places for the men who rode the boats, for the mule drivers, and for the travelers. The two restaurants served bacon, beans, bread, butter, and tea for $1. By 1860, there were 14 buildings. Two early businesses that operated in Port Pemberton were Mr. Drinkall's Pemberton House, and we made a, an ad for that. We thought it was an ad and Otis Parsons Store. Two travelers who came through in 1859 reported that they purchased 13 pounds of bacon for $9.75, a horse for $75, and a bottle of brandy for $50. And payment was usually in gold dust. First preemptions. The first uh, privately held lands on the Lower Mainland were in this area. The first preemption was um, this P. Smith and Company. The route to the gold fields opened up a route for farmers to reach the rich lands of Pemberton, and even in the first years, they were staking lands at the foot of Mount Curry. Fresh vegetables were extremely scarce during the gold rush. Tomatoes sold for 75 cents a piece, cucumbers for one dollar, and farmers have never done better. In 1859, one settler cleared upwards of 240 pounds sterling an acre growing potatoes. Preempting land meant you would drive a corner post and record the preemption with the magistrate at Port Douglas. The settler had to live on and improve his land, have it surveyed, and finally pay for it at the rate of $1 an acre in 1860. And then you received your crown grant. The first preemption recorded at Douglas was for P. Smith & Co., who owned a stopping place at Port Pemberton. John Shaw was the second preemption, and in 1861, David Douglas, and James Scotty Halliday staked the third preemption. By 1861, the Douglas Trail was a 12-foot wide wagon trail and was the first highway on the Lower Mainland. A story or an excerpt in here of Charlie. Uh, 
sharing some of his memories. So he says, my grandmother was there. My grandmother told me the story about it. On the way up in Harrison Lake, when the kids just started to get sick, they just took them off the canoe and threw them in the bush to die. And we don't know how many died in the lake. When the kid gets sick, if anybody took sick, they would just leave it there. In Harrison Lake, and Pat Leo's boy, Pat Leo's brother, a young kid, took sick on the way up from Mission. So Pat Leo put his brother in a canoe and paddles it up through Harrison, Harrison River and then Harrison Lake. When they camp, he picked up his brother and took him to the shore and make a fire for him. So the kid was still alive. And pretty soon, his clothes are all smeared from the smallpox. And finally he got to Port Douglas and the boy died there. He buried him in the Port Douglas graveyard. Um, as one guy told me about it, he was from the Caribou. He told me, he says, I, he saw it, and he saw them people, dead peoples, at Port Douglas quite a bit. Some of them still in a tent dead. Some of them scattered outside the tent dead. After the snow was gone, he found them dead. And then my grandfather was working at a saloon out here where they called it Pemberton. He was working on a saloon washing dishes, and his boss told him, you take this thing, and when your children go to bed, give them a piece of this. They call it camphor. So my grandfather took them and took it home after he'd finished washing dishes, and when his children were going to sleep, he'd give a piece of it to each of them. They never took sick. Smallpox epidemic of 1862 had a huge impact on First Nations throughout the Pacific Northwest coast. The uh, steamship Brother Jonathan arrived in Victoria on March 12, 1862. Officials vaccinated as many white people as possible, but very few natives. And when native people camped near Victoria began dying of smallpox, Vancouver Island authorities forced them to leave and return home. This caused the disease to spread north from Vancouver Island to southern Alaska and south into the Puget Sound region. That year, it's estimated that almost half of the First Nations people perished, and the estimate is about 14,000 people. After 1862, we have the next big event is a Canadian wide event, the Canadian Confederation of 1867. By the mid 1860s, the gold rush had largely run its course, and the good times were over, and the British had um, built up quite a bit of debt building these roads and through the mountains, which is why nobody wanted the land anyway, remember, because it was going to be expensive. So, to save money in 1866, Britain folded the Vancouver Island colony into its British Columbia counterpart. The long-term future of the United Colony of British Columbia was much debated. Arrivals from within British North America wanted entry into the new Canadian Confederation, and that was created in 1867 out of the four British colonies of Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. Others, however, wanted annexation to the states. In 1867, the day after Britain confirmed that they'd be part of the Canadian Confederation, the day after, the U.S. acquired Alaska. So the new Caribou Road was begun in 1862, and it was completed the following year. An exodus from Pemberton commenced after that. The map shows the two routes with posted travel distances. The Douglas route took 40 days and was very expensive as you had to pay a man to unload the wagon, load the boat, unload the boat, load the wagon, and you had to pay each time you had a transfer. Uh, versus uh, the Yale route, you would get in your wagon and away you would go. So within a, a day or two, you would be well on your way north. And this Pemberton route, you'd still probably be stuck somewhere between Port Pemberton and Port Anderson. Also, sometimes people ahead of you or behind you had more money and they could skip the line. There was all those kinds of shenanigans going on. There was also uh, men who couldn't afford the boat trips and they scrambled along the sides of the lakes. That was part of the argument of the High Line Road, that um, enough men had traveled along that lake and it was a, considered a trail and that the uh, route wasn't just boat access along Anderson and Seaton. So I've got, uh, there was a competition really, uh, and Yale had huge business interests to keep the gold rush traffic running through the canyon and through Yale. So I've got a first person account here. This was published 
in either the province or the Victoria newspapers at the time. And it was meant to deter people from ever using the Douglas Trail. So this fellow says, travelers are assured they can get through from Douglas to Lillooet in 20 to 40 days at a cost of $150. So if you're determined, you can shun the high-toned and elegant route and take a splendid steamer at New Westminster for Harrison River. There, you can hire local natives to pull you over the rapids or walk along the pebbly shore, wade four sloughs and swim one small river to reach a high-toned propeller which runs at a speed of two miles per hour, wind permitting. No closed, con no closed confined cabins and doors, but pure, wholesome air on deck with the privilege of sticking your nose in the cook's gallery to warm it at no extra charge. In 25 hours, we'll take you to the mouth of Douglas Slough. Hire another canoe or swim to arrive at the boisterous town of Port Douglas, complete with a jail. Then foot it to 29 Mile House, over four feet of snow. The little lake being frozen over, walk around it to Lillooet Lake. Scenery delightful. There, catch another high-toned steamer if you can. If you can't, just wait a day or two. Meals are only a dollar. When you get aboard, rest yourself on the open deck for four hours. Weather moist, air keen. Reach Pemberton, good meals there for one dollar, beds 50 cents, bed bugs are free. <laughs> Rest there a day or two and foot it again for 24 miles to Anderson Lake and catch a steamer if you can. Then foot it over the short portage or take the railroad. Either way you will pay. Catch another splendid steamer, foot it again another three and a half miles to Lillooet. Take this road by all means and shun the Yale and Linton Road for it's a humbug compared to this experience. <laughs> surveyed the Pemberton Trail for the railway. So that started to inspire some ideas. Well, maybe the railroad's going to come. But to be honest, all Marcus Smith did was survey it, and nothing really happened then until 1914. Uh, in 1876, there was the cattle trail fiasco. The government, the provincial government gave monies, quite a bit in the day, to build this trail and improve it to the south so that people could get products to market. and. The monies were mismanaged and misspent, and no real improvements were made. A man named Robert Carson tried to drive his cattle down this trail, and they were mired to their belly, bellies in muck, and over half of them died before they ever reached Hell Sound. So uh, after that, the government, there was a legislative hearing, and the government investigated this, and after that, they decided no more money on the Pemberton Trail until we have a proper survey in place. And then in 1879, there was the murder of Tom Poole, and he had a stocking house at Poole Creek on your way to Darcy. In 1882, there was only one name left on the voters list with a Pemberton address, and his name was Macbeth. <laughs> it's not until 1885 that John Curry arrives, and he preempts district lots 164 and 165 in 1888. 164 and 165 are the lots uh, just beyond the museum here, Ertle and Collins Road and the old high school. This is district lots 164 and 165. So with no viable transportation route for wagons along the old Douglas Trail due to overgrown brush, settlers focused on improvements to the Pemberton Trail south to house Sound. Uh, in 1879, the murder of Tom Poole and his young children was a major event. The coroner from Lillooet, Casper Fair, and Lillooet was the center of government for this area at the time, and he arrived to investigate. Now, he probably got here two weeks after the event, or maybe even longer. Who knows how long it took before somebody even found the remains. But gold was thought to be the main motive, as the Poole stopping house would have been accepting gold as payment, and there was probably gold under the floorboards. At first, Chief Hunter Jack of Darcy was implicated because of a tip from Scotty Halliday, who you'll remember was one of the first people that preempted. So this Scotty Halliday was around in the area for 20 years when this happened. So Scotty said it was Hunter Jack. And Policeman Livingston was assigned to this, the case. And um, Dan Carey, Walter Burgess, and Scotty Halliday were all implicated, and in the end, Scotty was charged. He was dragged up to Clinton for a trial. They held a trial. The jury deliberated forever, and they couldn't come to agreement on anything. So then he was brought to a jail in New Westminster, and he spent 12 months in jail in New Westminster 
went through for another trial, and there was 14 days of evidence. The judge, it took the judge to sum that evidence up, uh, 2.30 p.m. until 11 p.m. at night. The jury came back at 1 a.m. with the verdict of not guilty. Legend has it, though, though they were all acquitted. One later hung himself. One went crazy in his cabin up the freezer where he always kept a gun near the window. And Scotty had quite a bit of money and died a few years later. Now, John Curry arrives in 1885 in uh, Preamps District Lot 164 and 65 with his partners. His partners were Dugald McDonald and Owen Williams. And John Curry soon became the first postmaster of this area. This, he was really the start of permanent settlement. All of the people that came prior to John Curry, uh, Curry largely just passed through, but um, he came, I guess he possibly passed through. He preempted also in Ashcroft, but he decided to settle here. Eventually, those Curry lands are subdivided in 1910, and this becomes Pemberton's first big development, and this had to do with the railroad coming, the railroad uh, purchased up lands near railway stations to then subdivide and sell them. The Gold Rush era was a dramatic chapter in the history of this area. The impacts on Little Watt lands and people were long standing, particularly the smallpox epidemic of 1862. The characters that passed through the area in its heyday included Begbie and Bushby, Governor Douglas, who was reportedly quite drunk when he came through Cumberland, and Dr. Cheadle, who was BC's first tourist, and many others. It was a brief period, but an important one, as it's part of the bigger picture of the BC Gold Rush and the establishment of British territory on the mainland, along with the 1871 establishment of BC as a province in the Confederation of Canada. The period made huge physical changes to the region with the construction of the road, the building of the dam at Tenas, and the establishment of Cameron Land as a good place to settle and farm in the southern coastal mountains of this new province. 